okay, I'm a bit, I don't know how to act as a diplomat. I think for doing that, I, like, I only know how to wear it like a one, but I'm, I'm an activist and I want to talk like an activist. I keep hearing the talk about everyone saying we can negotiate this and that. In reality, I don't know who's going to enforce that. Those saying there is no thing else besides political solution to the person who is doing everything in his power is not going to solve the issue. Waiting a little to fall apart like that is not going to be a good solution for anyone. I think al Nusra Front is waiting us to beg. The civilians come to them and beg for help. And right now we are trying our allies. We are trying the people we look alike, we think alike. But if they fail us, I don't think we should really criticize other options. Yeah, the siege of Aleppo is hard. The political solution is not working. I'm sorry, I know many of you spent whole of their days on the political solution, but there is no such a thing. Because from the political solution started, we lost Daria, Maldomia, and Alwar. Aleppo is besieged. And first I worked on Aleppo is burning, and Amran, and the shop for this. And since the Geneva Treaty, this is this whole event. And some asked why Syrian government has a huge face. That's why. Aisha. So yes, sir. I, I loved the statement yesterday, but I didn't know how we to enforce it. I loved your statement yesterday. It was like, and we have hopes still as Syrians. We keep saying, like, have you heard what? Here you said yesterday, Norman was sharing it. And then later on, we will come back to reality and say, well, okay, then who's going to enforce it? That's right. Look, I, I get it. Um, I, a lot of us wish there was an enforcement mechanism right now. A lot of us have been fighting for one. Um, but we don't have one right now in that sense. So we're trying to pursue the diplomacy. And I understand it's frustrating. You have nobody more frustrated than we are. Michael's frustrated, I'm frustrated, Don's frustrated. It's, uh, you know, it's hard. Um, the problem is that, you know, you get, enfor quote, enforcers in there, um, and then everybody ups the ante, right? Russia puts in more, Iran puts in more, Hezbollah is there more, and Nusra is more, and Saudi Arabia and Turkey put all their surrogate money in, and you all are destroyed. I mean, this is, this is a problem, uh, is figuring out how do you get people to a place of being rational. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, it's, we can always throw a lot of weapons in, but I don't think they're going to be good for you. And, uh, you know, people who are determined just to fight, 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 can destroy things completely, right? So we're trying. We're trying to find a balance here to see if we can get to a negotiated process with an end of the violence while we do it. That's why we're fighting so hard for the cessation, so that you're not living day to day with fighting around you, but there's a political process that supplants the fighting. Nusra makes it hard. Al Nusra and Daesh both make it hard because you have this extreme element out there. And unfortunately, some of the opposition has already kind of you know, chosen to work with them. Anyway, but let me listen to the rest of you before we gonna hear what else. Um, but we've heard a lot of talk recently, and I don't want to repeat what I just said in the event prior to this. And we were hoping to get some of your reactions and 
I don't know what you said. Okay, <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will translate because I heard it from the beginning, sorry. You know, go ahead, go ahead. Um, yes. You said, I don't want to uh, talk because we did a Syrian and a lot of talks already and you know what we want to see. But I knew you were in a really important meeting and I wanted to ask you what happened in there. I wanted to know from you what's happened in that meeting. So what happened is we, we told the Russians and the Iranians that we can't just do the same thing. We can't just go out and announce the ceasefire if there's no change to show that it's serious. Translation. What? Translation. So we propose to the Russians that they prove that they're serious by having no warplanes flying, no Assad planes flying for seven days, at least, in order to prove to the opposition that they're not going to get killed if they're trying to help people or if the humanitarian assistance comes in, because it's the airplanes which have been causing most of the damage. فاحنا اللي اقترحنا لروسيا انه اثبتوا انكم انتم جديين من خلال انه ما يكون في اي طيران بالطائرات الحربيه التابعه للنظام على الاقل سبع ايام عشان نفرج المعارضه نثبت للمعارضه انه هم بيقدروا يعملوا عمل بدهم اياه بدون ما يتم قصفهم وبرضه نثبت انه العمل الانساني ممكن يتم بدون ما يتعرضوا الاشخاص اللي بيقوموا فيه بالقصف. So the Russians were willing to offer three days. And we said, that's not enough. That's a game. You know, you, you got to be serious here. The deal we made in Geneva said seven days consecutive of calm before we would talk about focusing on Daesh and Nusra. فالروسيين حكوا انه رح يعطوا ثلاث ايام بس احنا حكينا هي يعني لعبه انتم ما عم تكونوا جديين احنا الصفقه اللي اتفقنا عليها بجنيف تحكي سبع ايام وبعديها ببدا التعاون ضد النصره وداعش. So that's really where we had a lot of discussion. Many ministers felt that uh, Russia needed to provide this guarantee. Some talked about increased monitoring, that we need to get monitoring in, which we all agree, but we're not sure who can do the monitoring and, and how they'll be safe. And that's really what happened in the meeting. The Russians are sending the idea back to Moscow. And we'll learn tomorrow whether it's yes or no or some variation. That's where we are. Thank you. What would you what, what what is your idea of what would make a difference? To be honest, I don't think the U.S. should have a monitoring role inside Syria. It needs to have monitoring. مؤسسات عاملة في سوريا من منظمات مجتمع مدني في سوريا أكيد كلياته يعني بتوقع أقمار صناعية وطائرات بدون طيار بتطير في سفور سوريا هي أكيد شايف الخروقات اللي عم تصير في سوريا. We have planes without pilots. There are satellites. Um, we have civil society organizations working on the ground that can see these violations. نحنا. صراحة بعد القصف القافلي الإنساني من قبل الطيران السوري أو الروسي ما تأكدنا إحنا من نوع الطيران تعرضنا لصار درنا نحصل عدة تسريبات صوتية بتقول إنه راح يتم استهداف مراكز الدفاع المدني بعد الفيديو اللي طلع وشفنا إحنا بصرية وزارة الدفاع الروسي 
اللي بتقول انه اذا بدكم تعرفوا مين قصر الطيران مين قصر القابل يسعر الوقت من الناس. Um, after the convoy was bombed by either Russia or Syria or the regime, we're not sure at this point, we received um, leaked voice messages that are saying that the white helmets or white helmets locations will be uh, specifically targeted um, and that uh, if the Ministry of Defense is asked about what targeted those areas, um, they would say white, white helmets or the Syrian civil defense. ما بتوقع روسيا هي قادرة تكون ضامن الأسد لأنه هي شريكة لا تعتبر هي طرف سادس إحنا نعتبر روسيا هي شريكة مع النظام بقصف السوريين بقتل بقصف الأسواق الشعبية بقصف حتى فرحنا نحن سجلنا خلال من شهر السنة الماضية بداية تدخل الروسي من أول يوم حتى اسباط اكثر من 17 شخص قتلوا من الدفاع المدني على ايدي بالقذائف الروسيه. Um, we don't believe that Russia can be the guarantor of the actions of the regime. We see that Russia as a partner of the regime in bombing Syrians, uh, Syrian civilians, marketplaces, even our own teams, the Syrian civil defense teams. We've documented since the start of the Russian uh, intervention in Syria, from day one until February of this uh, year, more than 17 of our Syrian civil defense personnel have been killed by Russian strikes. Do you have any videos of, of the airplanes that these strikes? Have you some videos on them? Have you got a boss in the flight off? I'm not Can we get I mean, I've been looking for videos from ages. I've been asking for them. I'm looking for videos from so can I just say, we get a lot of videos of the victims of these attacks that are terrible, but they don't help us. We need videos of the actual aircraft and the munitions, and there's a lot of them on the internet, and we don't know whether they're real or not. So verified videos of the actual aircraft is the most useful thing. And often when we see the videos of the aircraft, it's... You know, in, in their defense, it's hard to capture the aircraft in the moment of dropping it on, so you see the aircraft, and then a few minutes later, there are people on the ground dying. But yeah, no, I was, yeah. um, what is actually very helpful is photographic or video evidence of the munitions, particularly if there are large fragments which can be identified. Michael, by the way, do we have people in Aleppo where the trucks were hit? Looking for the munitions evidence. Uh, yeah, I understand they are. Actually. Can you make sure of that? Can we get that back to us in a sort of verifiable? Yeah. So I just heard today the UN actually wants to start taking that on in an organized way to actually do some kind of a, a, a real team to go out and investigate it. Well, they better jump on it before yeah. it all gets cleaned out of there and see if they can yeah. and get the good people too. You can certainly tell if it's an advanced Russian munition. Yeah. That's, that's the, that's right, but I mean, they've got to get right on it. Yeah, and they, I think they are actually. We should check. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Who else? Amber from the Clinton Stock of the United States of the Uh, I prefer to put them in Okay. بعتذر إذا كلامي بيكون قاسي إنه أنا طبيعتي طبيب جراح يعني أو ممكن الشيء المرة أو الشيء اللي شفناه التجربة اللي عشناها هي خلتنا شوي يكون قلوبنا قاسية يعني نحن يعني أنا على نحن مؤمنين إنه الكل متورط في النزاع في سوريا والكل جزء من الحل um, I apologize if what I'm going to say is a bit harsh. Um, I'm a surgeon by profession, um, and just from what I've seen and what we've experienced, our hearts heart, have hardened. Um, I believe that everyone is involved at this point in the Syrian crisis, uh, but that also means that they're part of the solution. <laughs> يعني لازم يكون في منيك أكشنز يعني أكثر من 
الولايات المتحدة بخصوص الموضوع في سوريا يعني بخصوص الكريزس في سوريا يعني نستغرب ليش الروس يعني واقفين بصف النظام بهي القوة ودول أصدقاء سوريا يعني نشوف في تخليات عن الموقف اللي 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 السنة الماضية اللي يعني كل سنة عن سنة عم نشوف هناك تراجع بقراراتهم أو تراجع بكلامهم يعني بالنهاية والكل بيعرف مين اللي بيخترق الهدنة يعني لسه بحاجة لفيديو أو بحاجة لتصوير أو لسلاتات لهذا الموضوع الكل الأمر واضح لكن بحب بس أأكد على موضوع فك الحصار في مدينة حب الموضوع Uh, I believe that we need more action by the U.S. Um, on Syria. Um, we're confused as to why Russia is so strongly siding with the regime, whereas we find the friends of Syria, their positions or their rhetoric weakens year by year. Um, the violators of the cessation of hostilities are clear. Do we still need video and photographic evidence uh, on this? <laughs> يعني مو مجرد كلام يعني لازم يكون في هناك تدخلات فعلية يعني خلق نوع من التوازن يعني يعني مثل ما ذكرنا الروس واقفين بموقف قوي بجانب النظام بتدخل عسكري بقراراته بمجلس الأمم يعني نحن نتمنى يعني المعاملة بالمثل تقريبا يعني من الولايات المتحدة And I also want to stress the point of the need to break the siege of Aleppo. I don't want to have to continue to talk about this. We need actual intervention. Um, so I really feel that there needs to be a balance. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, there's a very strong Russian position siding with the regime. Um, whether it's through their military intervention or the decisions and votes that they take inside the Security Council. And we want and we expect similar support from the U.S. and from our funds. Can I just build on this, on this point in particular? Because sure. we believe that there is a, a deep contradiction between the strategic objectives of the United States of America and the Russians in Syria. The Russians would love to see as soon as possible in Syria just only the shell as a from one side and us from the other side and right? destroy any kind of un moderate opposition on the ground and to put the world into into the choice that you have to choose to choose between the shared Assad and ISIS. I we do not understand uh, and this this has been the case since two thousand twelve since Geneva communicated. We do not understand how it it can be expected from the Russians to change attitude and to behave differently and to come up to a strategy that has common objectives with the Americans and with the, with the, with the Syrians and with, with the international community to abide with the UNSC group. Well, the problem is the Russians don't care about international law and we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't have the basis, our lawyers tell us, unless we have a UN Security Council resolution which the Russians can be with the Chinese, or unless we are under attack from the folks there, or unless we are invited in. Russia is invited in by the legitimate regime. Well, it's illegitimate normally, but by the regime. And so they were invited in, and we're not invited in. We're flying in airspace there where they can turn on the air defense, and we have a very different scene. The only reason they're letting us fly is because we're going after ISIL. If we were going after Assad, those air defenses, we have to take out all the air defenses, uh, and we don't have a legal justification, frankly, for doing that, unless we stretch it way beyond the law on a humanitarian basis, which some people argue we should, by the way. Uh, but so far, American legal theory has not bought into the so-called right to protect. 
uh, and we don't even have what we had in Kosovo, where we had a you know existing resolution and so forth, uh, even though we went alone. Uh, so it's complicated. It's uh, it's not not easy. And we've been fighting. How many wars have we been fighting? We've been fighting in Afghanistan. We've been fighting in Iraq. We've been fighting, you know, in the region for 14 years. And a lot of Americans don't believe that we should be fighting and sending young Americans over to die in another country. That's the problem. Uh, Congress won't vote to do it. And you can be mad at us, but what we're trying to do is help Syrians to fight for their own country. And we've been spending a lot of money, a lot of effort to try to help do this. So there's an opposition there. The opposition is doing very well. And Russia came in. And that's a problem, I know, because you know we uh, we don't behave like Russia. It's just a different standard. So we're trying to see whether we can put to test whether Russia is serious about a political solution. And if they're not serious, then we will help the opposition more. But I don't think you're going to, you know, I don't think that's particularly good for the citizens of Syria in the end, because it means more fighting. Pardon me, I'll, I'd like to add uh, something about the political, uh, political uh, point that uh, now the, the world always focuses on the extremist Sunni groups fighting in Syria. And in Vienna Communique, when the agreement spoke about having a credible and non sectarian uh, <coughs> governance in Syria, that was difficult to uh, sell to, to the communities on the ground and to our fellows and to our activists because it speaks only about the extremist Sunnis and ignores the extremist Shia fighters who are coming from Iran, from Hezbollah and Lebanon, from Iraq and other areas. Well, they're a terrorist organization. We, we've designated them a terrorist organization. Yeah, but according to the Russian, uh, Russian-American agreement, the airstrikes in Syria would be only against the Sunni, the extremist Sunnis. Yeah, because the, and the reason for that is that they have both basically declared a war on us and are plotting against us. And Hezbollah is not plotting against us. Hezbollah is exclusively focused on Israel, whom they're not attacking now, and on Syria, where they are attacking in support of the... Uh, uh, in support of us, so it's a uh, you know. No, I, I entirely un understand your position as representing the American interests, because these Shia groups they do not attack the United States, of course. But how to uh, make the majority of the Syrian people accept this approach? I'm sorry. What? The... How to make the Syrian people accept this argument that because. Uh, Hezbollah, or Fadl Abbas, the Iraqi and the Iranian groups are not fighting the United States now, so they are not uh, targeted by the attacks against terrorism in Syria. They kill well, Syrians. They are, they are targeted by the opposition. <coughs> and we are arming. So, and training. Okay, I will update to that, can I? Sure. I'm from Aleppo, and I'm a social media activist, so I work for six campaigns over a little in the last six years. Do you know how many there for Aleppo? How many social media campaigns asking for protection for Aleppo? Maybe one or two. In Aleppo we have six. We have almost each six months we have one. So it's not a, to me, convincing me it's a battle against ISIS is really hard. Because we lost Daria. Daria is like our sweetest romantic dream of the revolution. And we lost that last month. So, what we are moving forward is another experience of Iraq, where ISIS is there, controlling half of the country, half of the population feel that it's an existent battle and their only exit with it will be ISIS. So, I don't want this scenario for Syria. So, you, you, we are arming people to fight for Syria? I don't think we are. I think in reality, 
We are not arming the right people now. That's why we are losing a lot right now. And I don't want it to be here next year when we're going to discuss how we lost Aleppo and there is still Idlib and Aleppo. So, in reality, there is not enough political and armed support to those who consider them moderate. I wish we had his friends, not because they don't respect the international law, but because they are his friends. Well, let me ask you, Michael. I mean... I think we've been putting an extraordinary amount of arms in, haven't we? Yeah, and I have to say, as you said, it's a double-edged sword because you give people the ability to defend themselves, but when you pump more weapons into a situation like Syria, it doesn't end well for Syrians because there's always somebody else that's willing to pump more weapons in for the other side. Um, the groups, the, the armed groups in Syria get a lot of support not just from the United States, but from other partners. And we've never said that that Qatar, was Russia, uh, Qatar, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia a huge amount of weapons coming in, huge but, amount of money. But pumping weapons in causes someone else to pump more weapons in, and you end up with a level. I mean, the reason, the reason Russia came in is because ISIL was getting stronger. Daesh was threatening the possibility of going to Damascus and so forth. And that's why Russia came in because they didn't want a Daesh government. And they supported Assad. And and uh, and we know that this was, this was growing. We were watching. We saw that, that Daesh was growing in strength. And we thought Assad was threatened. Uh, we thought, however, we could probably manage, uh, you know, that Assad might then negotiate. Instead of negotiating, you got Assad. Now you got the Putin to support him. So it's it's truly complicated. I mean, you know how complicated it is. You live in it. But for us politically, where we have a Congress that will not authorize our use of force, Congress will not pass that. And so we're trying to help the best way we can, but we finally decided the best thing we can do is try to find a way to have a political solution where the opposition is part of the government. And you can have an election and let the people of Syria decide who do they want. You don't believe in an election. Let's go and elect Hitler then. Yeah, I don't. I think that there is accountability to that person. He killed a million. Well, why can't you have accountability at the ballot box? And why? Why can't you have an election run by the international community? Which we don't trust already, okay, then? Well, you got to start somewhere. Okay, if so the international community sets up an election under the strictest standards of elections, and people in all the camps and all the diaspora are allowed to vote, which is the agreement, so in Jordan they can vote, in Turkey they can vote, in Lebanon they can vote, in America they can vote, in London they can vote. Everybody who's registered as a refugee anywhere in the world can vote. Th are they going to vote for Assad? Assad's scared of this happening. Very scared of this happening. We know this. We know this from intelligence and we know it from the Russians. So, you know, democracy has some virtues, folks. Majority of your guests are arriving. I'm coming more to the stairs. So, that's so anyway, I you know, person. I don't dismiss that automatically. Think about how it could work. But the problem is, when we want international law, we use it on the table. When it is rel related to accountability to dictatorship that killed one million, then international law is not important anymore. Uh, torture doesn't go by election. Genocide doesn't go by election, thank God. The activists around the world push forward that international law put those as a big no. So if we wanted to stick to the international law, we keep sticking to the international law. But when it's in, on the best interest of the major powers, we will say, the international law won't allow us to intervene. But when it's the base case, let's go to election and elect Bashar Assad. Anyone who's not going to approve that, so we are... Discussing a scenario that's not going to happen. And, and, and my belief is the Russians are supporting this, uh, this uh, agreement. It means that they are going to manipulate these elections and to re-elect the share of well, well, And they have the ability, they have the resources, they are controlled over uh, half of the country, over half of the population with iron. 
So they, they have all, all possible, all How would you know? What about the regime and what the regime and the And the areas under control of the regime itself. They don't have free choice. They will so go by power to elect him. <laughs> We live that, we know that Syrians under control of the Mukhabara, the security intelligence of the Ba'ath party, they would not dare, regardless if they are observers from all the world, they do not dare to go to the elections and say no. They give me the papers of my mother incidents and gave me to sign it that they didn't kill her. They give me answer to sign how many, how many people is that? That's a few million people, correct? How many people are displaced? How many of those who are displaced have families are still inside Syria and they are afraid of? Yeah. We can debate that. We are debating should we go and... So you think the only solution is for somebody to come in and get rid of us? Yes. That's the only solution. Yes. Who's that going to be? Who's going to do that? Three years ago, I would say you, but right now I don't know. Well, look, it's a hard choice. I'm, part, I'm sorry. It's, uh, you know, we've lost thousands of young Americans in a lot of countries. And it's pretty difficult right now to get Americans to say, we're going to send Americans to invade another country and have a war with Sunni and Shia and extremists and everybody. I mean, you know, it's more complicated than you think. Nobody uh, requests an invasion. What? <laughs> Nobody requests an invasion. Nobody. Well, you got to win the war. you got to come in and occupy cities. You've got to go in city for city and fight against people who have IEDs and people who have sniper rifles. You know, it's complicated. And people now who may have gas and other things. So it is not easy. I'm just telling you, it's not easy. You know, there are lots of places in the world where people want to hold our coat while we go fight. But it's not easy. And we're trying to empower Syrians to be able to fight against this guy. Now, now the Russians have changed the equation, unfortunately. The Russians have changed the equation. And it's, it's a little more complicated. So we're trying to figure out a way to get to the table, if we can, and save lives. I don't think any country has worked harder to save lives than we have. We've given more money than any other nation for refugees regarding Syria. And, and we're trying very hard to try to provide access for humanitarian goods to get in to save lives. Doctor, I know you have you know, need for medical supplies. You need to save lives. We're trying to make it possible for you to do that. We're not disengaged. We're not saying, oh, we're sorry, we, we can't do anything. We're saying we're going to try and do as much as we can within you know, the scope of what we can do here. Mr. Sarazi, the, the UN was, Bashar Assad gave up his communication test uh, asked uh, under the settlement of the again. This is the only case when he responded to the United States. I have to part of partially gone. The transition, according to Geneva Communique, is part of UNSC 2118. He did not abide to that part. He abided only to the, to the chemical work. I think you're looking at three people, four people in the administration who have all argued for your support. And I've lost the argument. I've argued for your support. I stood up, I'm the guy who stood up and announced we're going to attack Assad because of the weapons. And then, you know, things evolved into a different process. But the bottom line is uh, that we, the Congress refused even to vote to allow that. Tony Blair went to Parliament, lost that vote. Okay. We have one question then. What is the bottom line? How many? How many students? What is the bottom line? Because chemical is there and it wasn't the bottom line. Hospitals, it was the title. You mean the red line? Yeah, no, no, what is the end of it? What we can do and it be the end of it? Well, Not clear? I, think, I don't know because I won't. I, I think it. people in Washington right now are deeply frustrated as you are. And we are talking about what enforcement mechanisms could we now take. 
And it may be that we will lift up the options because of the frustration, because of Assad's indifference to anything. So there's a different conversation taking place because of what's happened in the last few days. We'll see what happens. I believe mean, the United States is capable of making the airport that Bashar al-Assad is using to send his weapons against civilians out of service without sending any soldier. That he's what? Capable? Without sending any soldier, just to, uh, like, no fly zone, impose a no fly zone. Well, there's more and more talk. We're trying to get what we call a, a, an agreed upon no fly zone. Uh, and that's what we're trying to get. The Russians have agreed that if we get this process going, Assad won't fly. And that's what attracted us to this equation, was the idea that we might get a no fly zone. But if we're going to force a no-fly zone, we have to attack every air defense. And then we have to be willing to fly airplanes every day to enforce it. And it's very costly and very, it's a big deal. On the long term, I think it's cost-effective. What? On the long term, because if we did it in 2012, we would have been without ISIS. If we do it in 2013, right now in 2016. So cost-effectively... Well, in 2012, a lot of us were saying we should be... Sending people in and helping you. I'm frustrated too. I, I get it. I'm, you know, everybody at this table <laughs> wants to <laughs> do more. We have one minute. Do you have one minute to say how we in civil defense we die? 